In this video, we're going to begin our discussion of genetic engineering and biotechnology. And we're going to split this uh, unit into two small videos here, um, looking at different applications of, of genetic engineering and some different uses of biotechnology, and really some of the amazingly cool new uh, possibilities that we have in looking at uh, food and, and diseases and things that we're able to do now with, with new uses of technology in biology. It's really some amazing stuff. And so in this unit, we're going to take a look at these. And in this first video, we'll, we'll introduce some of these different principles. Now, the first, uh, first topic that we want to take a look at is gel electrophoresis. We've done this in class. We've talked about this already in class. And you maybe have done it somewhere else previously. Um, but gel electrophoresis is a really important uh, tool that we can use to help separate different samples of DNA. And they're going to be separated uh, based off of or by their size and the amount of DNA that's added. And, and in using this, we can help to identify different uh, individuals. We can look at different species, different samples. Um, we can use this for a wide variety of different applications. And the idea behind this is we add DNA to a gel-like substance we call agarose. Um, agarose can, can come in different amounts or, or different percents uh, of what it is. Typically, uh, you use a 1% gel, maybe a 2% gel, somewhere in that range. It kind of depends on the samples and what it is specifically you're looking at. Um, but DNA is added to this gel. It's kind of like a jello substance without uh, any color in it. It's a clear gel. And by applying some electrical current, um, DNA is going to move uh, towards the positive electrodes. So the DNA actually moves through this gel, and as it does, does so, um, different regions uh, of the samples uh, become separated. And they're separated based on the size of the samples. And so um, we can use this, um, this, 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 uh, this method or this technique to help us um, separate DNA. And we can, what we can do then is we can see, uh, for example, in our image here, um, these different bands that show up in electrophoresis are based off of the size. And so what these numbers here are referring to are different uh, numbers of base pairs. Uh, BP stands for base pairs in, in the DNA samples. And the smaller samples are going to move farther in the gel. Um, by applying some, uh, some UV lights uh, and staining these gels, we can actually see these different, different bands and then get an idea of how far they're moving. And so what we see here, this is a, a real image of, uh, of electrophoresis after it's been stained and, and what it looks like under some UV light. You can see these different bands here in, in each of these different lanes. We call them lanes. are going to be different samples. And you can see each of our samples have some slightly different bands. These two look pretty similar. Um, as does this one, these two are a little bit different. Uh, generally, when we're using gel electrophoresis, we'll use some sort of marker or a template in order uh, to compare some known distances like this here to our samples. Um, and so what's happening is the DNA is moving in this electrical field. We're actually applying some, con uh, some current, and they're going to separate according to their size, and they move towards the positive charge. Um, we can use this process of electrophoresis, and we'll talk about this a little bit more, but we can use this process in DNA profiling, both for humans and for different species. Uh, we'll talk about some of the uses of gel electrophoresis a little bit more momentarily. Now, another, another application that um, was developed uh, fairly recently um, is something called polymerase chain reaction, or PCR. And this was developed in 1985 by Kerry Mullis. Uh, and this is an amazing, really amazing uh, uh, new tool that we have um, that we can use in science. Um, and basically what's happening in PCR is we're taking a small amount of DNA, um, either that we've collected from a sample or from a specimen or maybe even from a crime scene. Uh, you've probably seen in CSI when they use DNA evidence to, to look at two criminals. This is what they're doing, essentially. Uh, we can take a very small amount of DNA we multiply it many, many times. Um, and so in our image here, we can see what's happening. We've got this sequence of DNA. We've identified a specific section or chunk or a target, is what we call it, uh, of, of DNA that we want to look at and to amplify. And so by adding in some things, uh, some DNA markers and some restriction enzymes, we can pretty much, we can basically produce many, many copies of that specific target or sequence of DNA. And we can use that in DNA profiling, um, identifying different types of species, 
diagnosing hereditary diseases, cloning sequencing, uh, DNA phylogeny. Um, basically, we can use this for a wide variety of different uh, applications in science. One of the really interesting things that that's been that has been used for is traditionally uh, before this technology, uh, we classified species based off of their appearance, potentially sometimes behavior as well. Now, by using this, we can look at actually the DNA of these species, and and we found that scientists have found that sometimes our old classification of species just has to be has had to been changed and rearranged because of this new information that we've acquired by uh, sequencing. Uh, and analyzing the DNA of these different species. Um, PCR is an amazing uh, technique and, and we're actually going to get a chance to use this in class. Um, one thing that, that's really important with, with PCR is, uh, and was important in its development is uh, we've talked about how DNA when it replicates those hydrogen bonds have to be broken uh, that hold the nitrogen bases together. And DNA polymerase uh, is what adds those new nucleotides. Um, during this process, uh, as we'll see in just a second here, in order to split and then re-add, um, in order to split the, the DNA, pull it apart, and then add new nucleotides to make more copies, uh, polymerase has to be used for that. And in order to actually have this happen, uh, there has to be a high degree of heat. And so before this process could occur, uh, scientists had to identify a type of DNA polymerase that could actually allow this, that could survive the, the high degrees of heat, uh, but still be able to um, add new nucleotides. And so uh, there's a specific type of DNA polymerase called TAC polymerase um, from TAC bacteria uh, that's, that's not going to be broken down by a high degree of heat, usually 94 to 96 degrees Celsius. And so um, we have to have this high heat to break the strands, but we need a form of polymerase that can do this, and, and that was identified in this uh, type of bacteria. And so now we use this um, DNA polymerase from this bacteria, and it's called TAC polymerase. Uh, the steps to PCR are, are kind of three main steps here. Um, we use a machine called a thermocycler, and these can range anywhere from uh, $1,000 to multi, uh, lots and lots of money, a couple thousand dollars. Um, just kind of depends on, on how efficient it is and, and features that it has. Um, but they've obviously come down quite a bit in price since their introduction. And so the steps to PCR, the first is denaturing, and that's heating uh, in this thermocycler to break apart the hydrogen bonds and thus exposing the nitrogen bases. The second step is annealing, and so in this stage the temperature decreases um, in order for the primers to form hydrogen bonds with the target sequence. That's basically starting to form those, those hydrogen bonds between the new nucleotides and, and template uh, nucleotide to the DNA strand. And the third step is extension. And so this is when that DNA polymerase, TAC polymerase generally, is adding nucleotides to the three end of the primer. And so then this process repeats itself, usually 20 to 40 times, kind of depending on what it is you're specifically trying to do. Um, and, and by this, we've created lots and lots and copies of our specific target sequence. And so you can see, just from starting with one sample here, a very small amount of DNA, um, after uh, a number of cycles, we already have quite a few different templates here. And, and as this process continues, we get more and more and more. And so we can take a very small amount of DNA and, and identify a specific region we want and then multiply it many, many times. Um, through gel electrophoresis and through PCR, um, we can use this for a couple of different, uh, different applications. Um, DNA profi profiling excuse me, can be used to identify suspects um, from very small trace uh, samples of DNA evidence, um, and more importantly and specifically, can eliminate innocent from investigation. Uh, can also be used to determine paternity. So if, if, if you're unsure uh, of who um, uh, is a, a parent of a child, you can do DNA test of the child and the parents to identify who the parent is. Um, pretty much <laughs> every person has their own DNA, except for identical twins. Um, and if we look at specific regions of each person's DNA, um, we can look at specific genetic markers or bands, um, and we can compare individuals' uh, genetic markers to make a genetic profile. And that's what we're talking about in, in DNA profiling. Essentially, you think about on your fingers, you have fingerprints, and these are unique to each person. 
The same idea applies with DNA profiling. Each person, unless it's identical twins, has different DNA. And so by examining specific regions of DNA from different people, we can get an idea of, of um, different markers or, or different bands if we're using gel electrophoresis that distinguish one person from another. Um, and usually what we're looking at uh, in humans is uh, regions called short tandem repeats or STRs. Uh, and these are highly repetitive non-coding sequencing regions. So we've talked about how some regions of DNA um, actually code for genes and some don't. These would be non-coding regions and they're unique to, in, to each individual. And so um, based off that, we can use that to distinguish between one individual and another. It's kind of like a DNA fingerprint. Same, as, same idea as, as your fingerprints on your hand. Um, and so here's kind of an image to, to help us see what, what we mean by that. Um, if we've got three different people here and we sample uh, their DNA in, in one of these specific regions, each person is going to have a slightly different markers. And so this, this first individual here has two markers in this region, the middle one's got these two, and the last one has uh, something completely different. And so we could identify these different people based off of their their different genetic markers. And so let, let's take a look at this in a, in a little bit more real uh, application. Let's say that we have um, DNA samples from a crime scene and we've got three different suspects. We've got one, two, three suspects here and here's the DNA evidence that we've taken and, and, and used gel electrophoresis to separate um, uh, from the crime scene. And so if we look at the crime scene uh, sequence here and we compare that to our three suspects and go ahead and do this right now, see if you can identify which suspect uh, is actually um, can be connected to this crime scene. So hopefully you've had a chance to look at this and, and um, hopefully you've come to the conclusion that suspect two, their sequence of bands here or genetic marcher, markers matches with what we see at the crime scene. Um, right here, these two line up, uh, they're lining up very specifically, the bands match with one another. And so using this DNA profiling, we can, um, we could for sure eliminate suspect three and suspect one, um, and suspect two would, would probably be a strong indication that they were involved or, or guilty uh, of whatever happened at this crime scene. Here's one more example that we've got. Uh, here's a victim, uh, our specimen evidence, and then three suspects, one, two, three. Go ahead again and, and take a, a minute to see if you can identify which of these suspects is most likely involved um, in, in this situation, in this crime. So hopefully in looking at this one, this, this image is not quite as clear, but hopefully you're able to identify that suspect number one here has, uh, has uh, some matching genetic markers compared to our specimen uh, evidence here. And so we can see that one and the specimen are, are pretty closely aligned. Um, and so this is, this is what we can use DNA profiling. This is one of the ways that we can use DNA profiling is to help identify or eliminate those that are, are not uh, guilty based off of this evidence. This is just one application of DNA profiling. The last thing that we want to discuss in this video is the Human Genome Project. And this uh, started, um, uh, was a 13-year project um, primarily coordinated by the U.S. Department of Energy and National Institutes of Health, um, but it wasn't just uh, governmental agencies carrying out, it was also a lot of private uh, corporations that contributed to our overall uh, process of the genome project and really what what this was project was doing was to sequence um, the entire human uh, genome to separate and to, to outline all of the A's, the thymines, the guanines, the cytosines in the human genome. Uh, and so I had a couple of specific goals identifying all of the about 20 to 25,000 genes in the human DNA, determining the sequence of about 3 billion nucleotides which is quite a few, um, and store information in databases and improve tools for data analysis. And so from this information that, that was obtained, um, we've been able to identify genetic diseases, uh, classify organisms based on DNA analysis, as I just dis discussed previously, um, able to produce drugs and medications based on an individual's gene sequence or protein structure. So Taylor um, is uh, providing medication specific to an individual based off of their gene sequences, um, identification of genetic diseases, and a lot of other new uses that are, that are popping up um, today. Um, and so the process of the Genome Project took 
quite a few years to actually to, to do, to actually sequence the DNA. Today, it's able to be done in weeks, days sometimes, depending on cost. And so we'll look at some of these topics a little bit further and some more applications of the Human Genome Project in the future, both in class and our second video.